Mr. Minister, once again, thanks for hosting us today. Well, well, it's a pleasure to have you around, Peter. Right, thank you. So, what would you say is the investment climate in Nigeria? The investment climate, it depends on how you want to interpret it. Uh, if you want to ask the question is what the investment appetite is, I hope it's saying that uh, it's huge. And that's driven by the many, many opportunities in the country. Uh, it's also driven by, of course, money follows money, by the level of return on investment. And I'm sure you're aware that UNTAG, in their last report, actually identified Nigeria as the fourth, where you get the fourth highest return in the world. Um, with an average return of about 35.5%, that compares to a global average of about 6%. So that's one of the major drivers. The second major driver is a strong macroeconomic environment. So we're talking about a country that has consistently average return on uh, return growth has been about 7% over the last 10 years minimum. A country that has, when you look at the debt to GDP ratio, it's only about 12%. When you compare that to the average in Europe, average in Europe is about 18.4%, and most countries are above 100%. When you look at the exchange rate, it has remained stable over a long period of time. When you look at inflation, it's up 10%, roughly about 8% now. So when you look at the capital markets, we delivered about 35% in 2012, 47% in 2013. So when you look at all that, the macroeconomic environment is actually very strong and very stable. Now, when you look at the policies of government, this particular government is driven by a number of transformational policies that are actually encouraging investors to come into different sectors of the economy. But the final point I want to make is a, just a general rule also, that if you look at what investors need, investors need the capital. They need the technical know-how. That's the second point. They need the raw materials if you're investing in the real sector of the economy. They also need a market to sell to. When all those four come together, you definitely make huge returns for your shareholders. Capital and technical know-how, you can move anywhere in the world. You made mention of the appetite for that attracts foreign direct investment into the country. And some people have expressed concern about the power generation, which some people say is an inhibitor, if I may put it that way. How are you addressing those concerns? You see, the, the, the power situation, yes, is curtails investment. But when you look at the history, countries have been operating in this country for decades. And the return on investment remains as high as 35.5%. Mm -hmm. So what that tells is that there are ways around that, which the bigger companies have actually done. They've gone around that. So all the companies you see today operating in the country today, they operate in the same environment. Yes, the lack of power makes the cost of production higher. But that's made up for by government incentives to start with, which is very generous to investors. It's made up of because of the cost of labor and raw material, which is quite low, and the market. So that, that offsets that. However, I think this is one government that in 53 year history of this country has privatized power generation and power distribution to address the issue of power. And as a result of that, yes, we have sold our assets, realized about three billion, but that's not the story. The story is that it has opened the door for the private sector to drive that. And today, we have aggregate pipeline investment of more than $100 billion coming to that sector. So we will see a gradual increase in power production, especially, as you know, it takes three years, roughly, uh, from start to finish. Uh, but I think over the next three, four, five years, you'll see significant increase because of the level of investment going to power. And again, we're not just relying on gas supply, we're looking at alternative sources of power, including coal to power and other, you know, hydro and all that. So I think this government has made that bold decision, which is paying off. And I think 
this, it will not be the same country in four to five years' time. But I'm afraid when you now have the power in abundance, I'm not sure you make that 5% return on investment anymore. So they always balance, you know, you look at the risk adjusted return, and that's why countries, investors are just coming to the country. So let me ask you uh, a first question. Nigeria is full of entrepreneurs. Um, any part of the world you go to, you see Nigerians, entrepreneurs everywhere. How are you attracting them back home and, uh, to come and help with your policy direction, to come and help their own people, employ their own people, create their wealth, keep them in this country? create more jobs for the people. I, I'm sure you're aware that I was also in the, I was one of the Nigerians in the diaspora. I was in the United Kingdom for about 30 years. I only came back in 2010. And I must tell you that since then, and even before then, we've seen quite a large number of people come back from, uh, from abroad, from whether the US or, Euro, or Europe and all that. Uh, and even within the cabinet, we have at least three or four people from the diaspora. If you look at the, some of the significant positions we have in the country, the MD of the Southern Wealth Fund is from uh, UBS. Uh, the, 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 the managing director of Amcon also came from So you will find that the younger generation and those who went many years ago have been able to turn that into brain. You know, the, the, it's no longer brain drain. It's now brain gain. Because we have acquired a lot of knowledge, experience, made a lot of contacts and we know we know that the opportunities are now in africa the opportunities are now in nigeria if you're not in nigeria you're not in africa to start with and the biggest asset in nigeria and has whether it's in nigeria or outside nigeria is our green passport because that is where everyone would like to be in three to five years time so i, I don't think we need to do much in fact my daughter, every program you go to, in Harvard Business School and all that, majority of the Africans there are Nigerians. And all of them, the younger generation, that most of them are CEOs of different countries, of different companies, even in Nigeria today. So the aspiration is to come back home and make, it's a very, very different dynamics now. And I, th I don't think we need to do too much to do that. Talking about investors, you know there is always competition, especially in West Africa. Every country in West Africa wants to be the gateway to West Africa. How is Nigeria competing and what have been the prospects of the competition of Nigeria attracting investors to this country? Let, let me first of all start by saying we see ourselves as one. So when you talk about ECOWAS, ECOWAS we're one. So there's no point saying we're competing against each other. We complement each other. That's the way we would like to see it. That's the way we would like to see the new Africa that's emerging. Having said that, when you're talking about competition, Nigeria today is 77% of ECOWAS GDP. So there's no point, it's not about competition, it's about how we work together. When you look at what Nigeria has, very few countries can boast of that, not whether Africa or outside Africa. This is a country that has about 84 million hectares of land where almost everything can grow. It's a country that has about 44 solid minerals in commercial quantity, and uh, which, which can be explored, and also we can have a valid addition. That's why today we have the Industrial Revolution Plan, because we want to leverage on that. This is a country that's already the seventh largest producer of crude oil, and has the eighth largest reserve of gas in the world today. A country that it today has a population of 170 million people. It's expected to be the third largest nation in the world after India and China by 2070. A country that has one of the fastest growing middle class in the world today with an average age of 18 years. That's all you're looking for to make money. That's what investors are looking for. So it's not a matter of you know, the natural resources are all there whether it's the natural resource in terms of minerals and other, or the human capital. When you look at the world in going forward, the younger generation in the top 10 globally, you find that Nigeria is one of those countries that have a young population in the world going forward with an average age of 18 years. When you compare that to Europe, Germany, Asia, that's an aging population. So you know that the future belongs to this continent. The future belongs to this country. So I don't think it's a matter of competition. 
It's a matter of how do we leverage on these assets, the human capital turned that into productive advantage, and of course, leverage on this, the, the natural resources we have as a country to the benefit of Nigerians, but more importantly, to also our ECOWAS brothers and sisters. It's now one ECOWAS, and we'd like to see ourselves as brothers and sisters as part of that bigger African uh, uh, story. Mr. Minister, you made mention of Nigeria's petroleum. Uh, people have raised issues about the over-dependence of, uh, on oil, especially when uh, Nigeria has plenty of arable land um, that can be the breadbasket not only of ECOWAS, but the entire continent and, and beyond. What are you doing to diversify that? What are you doing to transform the economy to you not only be reliant and petroleum. You see, that's a very valid question, and that's what a lot of people have said over the decades. But for the first time in the history of this country, under this president, under this transformation agenda, one the biggest priority we have in the country today is how we diversify our economy and how we diversify our revenue base. That is why when you look at the country, no government has had such transformation agenda across different sectors of the economy. So when you talk about the, uh, the agriculture side, the side of things, we have that Greek transformation agenda, which is all about increasing the yield, increasing the quality of our commodities, making them strong enough, meeting out international standards for export, for local consumption, and for value addition. Today, in the solid mineral sector, we have a minister, a program which is focused on industrial minerals. In the oil and gas sector, we have the gas revolution. On the infrastructure, we have the master infrastructure master plan to put that together. And when you talk about infrastructure, both soft and hard infrastructure, you're talking about, yes, transport, aviation, uh, technology, and all that. Now, to crown this, and the center for all this, is the new Industrial Revolution Plan. The Industrial Revolution Plan seeks to diversify the economy and the revenue base. It plays on areas where Nigeria has Strategic, has a competitive and a comparative advantage. Where Nigeria can be number one in Africa and a top 10 player globally, based on the resources we have. It looks across the value chain. So today, we have sectorial policies on sugar cane to sugar, for example. Before, we imported 97% of the sugar we consumed in this country, and yet we can grow sugar cane. So the new policies which investors have keyed into we have about three billion committed into that, is growing sugar cane and turning that into sugar. Now from the waste of sugar cane to sugar, you produce electricity, you produce animal food, you produce ethanol. Sudan has done that successfully, and that sector supports more than one million people. Today, based on the policy we have in the northern part of the country, we're going to set up sugar cane plantation in six northern states in the northern part of the country. That will create about 187,000 jobs within two years. If you look at the automobile, auto cars are made up of steel, they're made of plastic, and they're made up of rubber. We have iron ore, so we can move from iron ore to steel. We can move from gas, where the eight, we have the eight layers reserve, from gas to petrochemical to plastic. That is what most cars are made up of today. We have one of the best rubber plantations in the world. We can move from rubber to tires. That is our aspiration, not just to assemble cars, but also to be able to produce some of the parts. There are more than 2,000 parts there. We have the petrochemical, we have the oil and gas. Today, we have about $14 billion going into an integrated petrochemical plant, now into fertilizer, methanol plants, and all that. When that is completed by 2017, Nigeria will no longer import petroleum products. We will become a net exporter of that. We've done that successfully in the area of cement already. We have limestone. You take your limestone, 5% of that is gypsum, and that gives you your cement. In 2000, we produced, we had the capacity to produce 2 million metric tons of cement. Last year, we had the capacity to produce 28.5 million metric tons of cement. We became a net exporter of cement. By the end of this year, we should have capacity to produce about 39 million metric tons of cement in the country. This would make us one of the largest in the world 
But more importantly, we'll have one of the largest cement producing plants in the world in Nigeria. So the, 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 the move has already started. It was launched by the president on the, Feb on the 11th of February. I'm delighted to say that UNIDO, uh, which is the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in Vienna, uh, only last week uh, wrote to us to say they were adopting Nigeria and Ethiopia as two countries in Africa that they're going to support, that have the biggest potential to industrialize in the continent, and they want to support our industrialization drive. And that's based on the Industrial Revolution Plan, which the president launched in uh, February. Again, when you talk about the auto sector, based on the new policy, we have about 16 OEMs that are now committed into coming to Nigeria. One of them is Nissan. They've never been in Nigeria before. On the 2nd of October, the policy was announced. 3rd of October, we have created jobs and all that. That policy could seriously be undermined because of the security concerns in the country. How are you addressing that? We, we are concerned about security matters locally and globally. And I think any world leader, any senior policymaker you talk to, will tell you this is a global issue. It's not just a Nigerian issue. It's a new phenomenon which the world leaders together are trying to address. And Nigeria has its own fair share of that. What the Japanese, I'll use the Japanese as an example. What they have done, which I thought was very clever, is they understood that Nigeria is a very, very big country. We know a country today that's about 170 million people, right. big land streets. What they have done for the investors is that they have a list, they have the map of Nigeria there. And they showed, they put red where you have the security threats. When you look at it, it's limited mainly to three states in the northern part of the country. You can even look at it and minimize it to a few local governments in those three states of the Federation. The point I'm making, it's not that it's not a serious matter, it is that it's for now at least isolated in a particular area. So, and it is not, and given the effort the government is making today, given the fact that the international community has come together to say, look, we want to get to work together to address this issue, knowing that it could become a glo global issue. It's not, a, as I say, it's a global issue, it's not a Nigerian issue. We are very, very optimistic. And I think the investors take that view. An investor is not putting money to work for one year. It's not money to work for 5, 10, 15 years. It's taken a medium, long-term view when he puts money to work. And he knows that it's a temporary issue that will go away. I was in the United Kingdom when the IRA, we're doing all the things that we're doing that. Life continued, and, but it's ended, and things are moving. This is just a phase in the evolution of our own country, of our own democracy, and this will go away, and very soon too.